Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dearman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we go. The epistle to the Hebrews or the letter to the Hebrews. And here's what it says. Chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Well, he's not finished with the sentence yet, but that's two verses, and that's already loaded. Well, let me just stop and say that this letter, the author is unknown. Now, People believe sometimes that it's one person or another. A lot of people believe that the Apostle Paul wrote this, and there are many uh, characteristics that seem uh, Pauline. And others believe maybe it was Barnabas or some, some other of uh, Paul's companions or peop other people that were in the day. Nonetheless, it seems like this epistle to the Hebrews or this letter to the Hebrews is clearly to Jewish believers. In other words, uh, Jews, Jewish people who found Yeshua, Jesus, to be the Messiah and made Jesus the Lord of their life. So they're believers, but they're Jewish believers. And so, yes, it does speak to the larger body of Christ, the Gentiles as well, but it's largely written to Hebrews, the Jewish believers. And so, He's saying, think about it from that mindset, that, that mindset, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers. Now, this, is, this would really relate to the Jewish person because their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the patriarchs, all the way down, uh, David, the prophets and such, he said, spoke to the fathers. And then he says, by the prophets. See, the Jewish believers, they know exactly who he's talking to about, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. So here's the contrast. In the old covenant, all of our fathers, our ancestors of Judaism, in the Jewish faith, all of those ancestors, God sent the prophets to speak to them. But in these last days, in these last days, he's spoken to us. And I would presume that primarily is speaking to Jews in this case through his son. Well, do you remember when Jesus came, he said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in the ministry of Jesus, he didn't venture off to go preach to the Gentiles. He stayed with the Jewish people because he said that was his ministry assignment. Now, of course, once he was raised from the dead and he gave the Great Commission, what did he say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he said it, that was Mark 16, then Matthew 28, he said, go make disciples of all the nations. It's the same commission, but giving different parts of it, but make disciples of all the nations. So, of course, Jesus was all about the world being saved. He died for the sins of the world. But in his earthly ministry, he focused on his assignment from God, and that was to come to fulfill and uh, corroborate the covenant that God made with the Jewish people, starting with Abraham. And so uh, the writer of Hebrews here, and that's the way we'll refer to this person, the writer of Hebrews said that the prophets spoke to our fathers in times past, but in this day, God has spoken to us through his son. God spoke to our fathers through the prophets before. Now God has spoken to us through his very son. So this is the way the whole book starts off, and it, it goes on to say, uh, his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. So he says, look, this Jesus, Yeshua, 
is heir of all things. God the Father has appointed him to inherit everything. Well, remember that the Bible says we're joint heirs with Christ. Thank God. So it says heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Did you know Jesus was involved in creation? Oh, you better believe he was. Do you remember how John started his gospel? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And so Jesus, along with Father God, is the creator of heaven and earth. So it says here, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. There's so many nuggets in here, but let me see if I can move quickly through these. So it's talking about Jesus, and it says in verse 3, Jesus is the brightness of God's glory, and the express image of his person. Do you remember Jesus told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, I do what the Father does. I say what the Father says. And so he's the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power, by the word of Jesus' power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is all talking about Jesus. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty, that's Father God, on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, you might be wondering, was he not better than the angels before he even became a human being? Well, of course he was, but he was in a different form in that way. He humbled himself. He emptied his divine privileges and status in heaven and such to become literally a human being. Now, is he still God? Yes, he is and was still God. But he really did become a human being locked in one body in one geographical location at a time, gave up uh, other traits of uh, his abilities with God, though he was still God. But it says here, that by obedience, overcoming temptation as a human being, being tempted, overcoming those temptations, being completely obedient to God, uh, even to the point, Philippians 2 says, of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And so he by inheritance, so yes, he was better than the angels before he became a human being, but he lowered himself to become a human being, and then through his obedience and through his honor of Father God, God has highly exalted him, raised him from the dead, highly exalted him, and gave him an inheritance as a reward for that obedience, and gave him the name, placing him clearly far above, listen, as a human being, placing him far above the angels seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. So you can understand that, yes, he was, because he's all, he is God and has always been God. He's always been better than the angels. But he humbled himself and lowered himself to being a man. But God raised him up and now clearly seated him above the angels, gave him the excellent, a more excellent name than they. Verse 5, uh, he goes on to say, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, Today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, by the way, a little trivia. When did God say to him, what was the time you are my son? Today I have begotten you. What was that today? When did God begotten him, so to speak? When did God beget him? What was that day? Well, Acts 13 uh, is where Peter tells us that was the day he was raised from the dead. Now, of course, that's not when he became the Son of God because God gave his only begotten Son. But nonetheless, when he was raised from the dead, he was like born. The Bible says he was the first born from the dead. 
went from death to life. And God counted that as like a fresh new birth, like the type of our new birth. He was the firstborn among many brethren. Um, Hebrews or Romans 8, I believe, says. And so notice this, that God says, today I have begotten you. Now, he's always existed as part of God, eternity past. But nonetheless, when he was raised from the dead, that was a whole fresh start. And God said, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And verse 6, but when, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. See, the, the writer of Hebrews clearly establishing Jesus the Messiah, far above the angels. He said, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, see, he made them ministers, servants. But to the Son, in contrast, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And he goes on to say in verse 10, uh, the, the father said to Jesus, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? So notice in this passage, here's Father God saying to Jesus, uh, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, calling him God. Father God is calling Jesus God because God is three persons but one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the three of them make up God. So each of them can be called God because they are God, Father God, Jesus the Son, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so he says, your throne, O God, to Jesus is forever and ever. And then he also said in verse 10, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. Wow. Here's Father God saying to Jesus, you laid the foundation of the earth. Notice how there is no envy between the Godhead, the persons of the Godhead. Nobody's trying to be one up or say, well, I'm the one that did this or I'm the one that did that. No, they're giving credence. They are giving uh, honor to one another, lifting one another up, honoring what they've done in truth, righteousness, love, kindness, grace, uh, blessing. And so they're really modeling the way that God wants us to treat one another in the body of Christ. And so notice again, we got down here to verse 13. But to which of the angels has God ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Well, the answer is none. None of the angels. He only said that to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then talking about the angels, let's close with this. Verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? This is a very interesting little verse here. I know we're focusing on Jesus, but the writer of Hebrews is contrasting in this first chapter how much higher Jesus has uh, been given a place by Father God than the angels. But notice here, let's focus on the angels for a minute. Are they not all ministering spirits? See, they're spirits. They're in the spirit realm. So they are spirits. Are they not all ministering spirits? Now, the word minister means to serve. So ministering means serving. Are they not all serving spirits? Watch this. Sent forth to minister or to serve for those who will inherit salvation? Well, let's stop and identify who that is. Who is it that will inherit salvation, folks? That's human beings on earth who make Jesus the Lord of their lives and accept the sacrifice of Jesus. So he's saying, are not all these angels ministering or serving spirits? And these serving spirits have been sent forth to minister for those, not to those, but to minister for those who will inherit salvation? What does that tell us? Well, that tells us that angels have been dispatched 
from God the Father, and they're sent to help us and to minister for us. Now, how would that work? Well, let me just remind you of Psalm 103, verse 20, and it says this, Bless the Lord, you his angels, you ministers of his, who do his word. Notice, who do his word. What do angels do? They do the word of God. Whatever God says, they'll do that. Okay, bless the Lord, you his angels, you ministers of his, who do his word. And then it says, heeding the voice of his word. Isn't that interesting? Heeding, or they're responding to, the voice of God's word. Well, guess what? We're the ones that are supposed to voice God's word. And when we speak out God's word, angels can go accomplish that and minister for us, serve for us to accomplish things, to get things done on our behalf. They are messengers. They go do things. So as you speak the word of God, instead of speaking out of your emotion, instead of speaking your mind, instead of speaking frustration or speaking something contrary to the Bible, well, the angels won't go do that because they do the word of God. They don't they don't do wicked things. But I tell you what, there's some other spirits that are sort of the, the counterparts in the kingdom of darkness to the angels, which are in the kingdom of God, and that is the demonic spirits. And if you're speaking critically and negative and speaking death instead of life, oh, these demonic spirits would be happy to use your authority as a human being, releasing those words of death and to go and to bring things to pass. That's why we have to be so careful what we're saying. But see, on the life side, on the word side, according to Psalm 103, these and verse 21 says, these angels excel in strength. They're very powerful beings. It says, they do the word of God, but they heed the voice of the word. So as we're declaring God's word, in fact, Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I believe that's talking about the heavenlies, the spirit realm. And angels are set to flight as we're speaking God's word. Angels are set to flight. They're in action. They're moving and they're getting things done. And, you know, Psalm 91 says that, he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. So it seems to me, in fact, let me just bring up one other. Daniel started uh, mourning for 21 days. Do you remember this? But when the angel showed up with the answer, he said, from the first day that you set your heart to understand, to pray, he said, I was dispatched from the first day, but I got some spiritual resistance from uh, the prince of Persia. He said, and I had to get Michael to come and help me break through. But he said, from the first day that you begin to speak, he said, in fact, he said this, I have come because of your words. I have come because of your words. See, so let me tell you, I believe that angels are more at our disposal as believers. Not that we can say angels take out the trash and do my laundry and clean up my house. No, but as we speak the truth of God's word, as we're releasing God's word, angels have been sent to minister to do the Word of God. So we have more assets at our disposal than we realize we do in the Lord. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says. Well, that's, that's a good start here in the book of Hebrews, and I mean, we just barely scratched the surface of it. So don't miss any of this book. This is going to be a powerful book, and I'm glad you're reading with me, I look forward to chapter two tomorrow.